But I want to thank you for your welcome here, professors and dear students. Thanks to all of you for being present. It's a great honor for me to uh, address myself to this audience here uh, at Berkeley, one of the most prestigious universities around the world. And uh, including for us in Europe, it's a sort of myth. It's home to the free speech movement. It's home to uh, several Nobel Prizes, uh, field medal recipients, and prestigious researchers, professors, and students. I will uh, try to focus my speech on uh, global trade today and tomorrow. I try not to be too long, and the most interesting part, I think, will be uh, the debate uh, that will follow. Thank you for uh, accepting uh, this debate here today. I want to share with you uh, a few ideas and analysis on the benefits, but also on the risks and difficulties of globalization through uh, the current evolutions of international trade and international trade negotiations. And there could be no better place than here uh, at the International House of Berkeley. Europe and the United States, as you know, are engaged right now in very important, difficult, uh, far-reaching negotiations, usually called the TTIP negotiations, the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, which some also call uh, TAFTA on both sides on the Atlantic. Europe and the US uh, together represent more than a third of global GDP and more than uh, one-fourth of international trade. And of course, given to these numbers and facts, we have a key role to play to invent new rules that will apply to international trade for the 21st century. And I would like to uh, uh, quickly assess uh, the state of uh, the current state of affairs. First, we are entering a new age in international trade, marked by the, de the development of bilateral and plural plurilateral negotiations that are increasingly focused on disparities in standards and regulations. For more than 50 years, trade negotiations have taken place in a global, or at least multilateral framework. That of the GATT, uh, since 1948, starting at the Havana Conference, and then at the WTO, starting in 1994. This framework defined the common rules for global trade and organized regular rounds of negotiations to liberalize trade, especially uh, tariff barriers to trade. Until the year 2000, these successive negotiation rounds focused on tariff issues and were significantly shaped by OECD countries, successfully accompanied the development of international trade. This is no longer the case today, or at least not the, in the same way as it was true until 2000. Things have changed since the year 2000. Multilateralism entered a sort of crisis with the Doha round starting in, two th in the year 2000. This round, launched 15 years ago, has still not been completed. And in December of last year, uh, <coughs> ministers of trade of the whole world, 162 member countries of WTO, gathered in Nairobi. There has been some progress, but the round is not yet achieved and there were uh, limited uh, progresses in the different areas. The growing political power of new heavyweights, especially China, Brazil, and India, have changed power relations within WTO. In a context of slowing international trade since the crisis of 2008, the interests at stake in each country are fiercely defended. Essentially, WTO members are unable to go beyond the binary categorization that distinguished developed countries from developing countries. And today's situation is much more difficult than uh, this categorization. It is necessary to rethink these categories so that the rights and duties of all correspond more to the reality of their weight in global trade. Progress is sluggish, especially as nothing can happen if there is no consensus between the 162 member states, since uh, one single state can block everything by saying no. This state of affairs does not change 
my country's commitment to multilateralism in trade matters. It is the dip uh, diplomatic tradition of France, which is also expressed in the pol political area with our commitment to the United Nations. And the same applies to economic and trade issues in the different multilateral bodies. It is therefore of great importance to us that WTO remains a, a reference and a reference forum as guardian of the treaties and mainstay for the dispute settlement body, which you certainly know. The latter has proven its efficiency in the peaceful resolution of trade disputes between states. And we know when we look at history what non-peaceful settlements or resolutions can bring uh, meaning war, meaning uh, conflicts between countries. Concerning the Doha round, we are considering, along with other countries, the best way to relaunch multilateralism, concluding what needs to be concluded as part of Doha, and finally working on new topics in world trade. I will come back to that later on. Since the 1990s, regional trade agreements have been multiplying in particular with NAFTA. The European Union is also involved in this process and about 20 rounds of negotiation are going on with different countries or different regional organizations all around the world. The same is also true for the US and of course we all think of the recently concluded Trans-Pacific Partnership, TPP, which is a very important commitment for your country. This evolution of multiplication of bilateral negotiations is not without risks. And uh, these negotiations outside the WTO framework are supposed to strictly respect the rules defined multilaterally. But this is often theory and it's not always true in practice. Let's put it that way. The risk of fragmentation in international trade regulation does exist and the IMF itself publicly expressed its concern on this issue in a report uh, published in May 2015. From the point of view of trade itself, the nature of trade flows has changed substantially. What we call the internationalization of value chains had a decisive impact on international trade. And in the words of the economist Richard Baldwin, we have gone from the 20th century trade that helps to sell goods to the 21st century trade that helps to make goods. And it's not of the same uh, signification, of course. In this context, manufacturing and consumption standards are now at the heart of trade negotiations, which is completely new. They are designed to marginalize discussions indeed intended, sorry, to reduce customs duties. Paul Krugman revealed in 2014 the following sentence, the glory days of trade negotiations, the days of deals like the Kennedy round of the 1960s, which sharply reduced tariffs around the world, are long behind us. Old-fashioned trade deals are a victim of their own success. There's, there just isn't much more protect, protectionism to eliminate. The object, this is the end of quotation, the objective is now tending towards reducing regulatory disparities, which are described by some economists as non-tariff barriers to trade. It is not possible to take an oversimplistic view on these issues, the issue of standards and norms, and pretend that they could only be considered as an obstacle to trade, because they sometimes also express political choices, democratic choices, which every society is allowed uh, to make for itself. The second point I want to make is to say that international trade raises now new questions, political and democratic questions, at a time when public opinion is questioning its economic and social benefits. It's true in Europe, but it's also true here in the US, I think, and when I look at uh, the different um, aspects of the ongoing campaign, I think it is a confirmation of what I said. I will stop here. Indeed, from the point of view of principles and from that of economic and social effects, international trade negotiations are no longer appealing and are even a cause for concern on both sides of the Atlantic. This skepticism, of course, is not a new thing, but 
uh, we have to look at the fact that uh, globalization led to lots of uh, benefits but also to lots of difficulties and problems especially for the middle classes. We have assisted to an opening of our economies over the last 40 years and uh, it's true in France, it's true in Europe, it's true in the US, it's true all around the world. This opening had a significant impact on economic growth and um, different studies are there to assess it. You can certainly confirm this later on. But what counts most is that this opening also had an effect you know, on the decrease in absolute poverty around the world. The proportion of poor people in the world during this period has been reduced by half, going from half to one-fourth of the world's population. These are the positive aspects. Nevertheless, the development of trade agreements has also had negative effects, of course, particularly on employment in developed countries on both sides of the Atlantic. Economic studies carried out today by universities or international organizations like the IMF point out the highly redistributive effects of free trade. In other terms, within countries, inequalities between rich and poor have increased. Middle class employees in developed countries are aware of the risks posed by international competition to their jobs and they see it on the ground and they have confirmation in different sectors. This concern about the economic and social effects of trade liberalization is coupled with a question on respect for transparency and democracy. Because by extending to all economic sectors and to new regulatory issues, trade negotiations affect collective choices. First of all, topics that are highly sensitive like health, environmental issues, or paid employment conditions and the welfare state are facing demands for trade facilitation. On topics of this scope, it is of course obvious that we cannot negotiate in the same way as we negotiate the reduction of customs duties. It is not about finding mutually acceptable concessions because we cannot forego health security, environmental protection or decent working conditions. So we can have no deal on that. We can only take the highest possible standards on both sides of the Atlantic and implement them on the other side. We cannot have a trade-off on this kind of issues. And the former WTO uh, Director General Pascal Lamy explained this uh, in a very precise way, better than I could do it here. The exponential development of global investment has gone hand in hand with increasingly stronger protection of the rights of businesses as opposed to public policies implemented by states. Initially, it was normal to protect businesses from arbitrary expropriations and to allow them to claim compensation from judges, guardians of their neutrality. This is, in fact, the reasons behind the arbitration mechanism between investors and state developed over the last 60 years. Nevertheless, over the last 10 years, maybe more, a growing number of disputes are threatening public policies in different states around the world with large compensations claimed by businesses. This eventually appears as a weapon of dissuasion against states and the exercise of their regulatory sovereignty. This corporate sector questioning of public policies in health, energy, or the fight against pollution is problematic, dangerous, and often unacceptable. It illustrates the new challenges raised by today's globalization. Lastly, the confidentiality of negotiation also raises questions, and too often they are done in secret. Of course, um, today the internet, social networks, and it's not here in California that I have to insist on that, have transformed the status of information. It has become difficult in practice, as in law, to invoke confidentiality of information when this information concerns the public concerns the citizens, including in your everyday life. I have noted this since I started following trade negotiations. Politicians or political leaders involved in public life are constantly chasing after leaks. The course of history shows that trade negotiations should be placed under more democratic control. 
control of the citizens. It is even a condition for action. Trade agreements should not only be economically beneficial, in theory, they should also be democratically acceptable and politically legitimate. And this is why I uh, took a position in favor of open data in trade negotiations, making information immediately accessible to citizens. Because information is power, and it's normal to give power to citizens in this area as in many others. All things considered, my conviction is that the future of trade negotiations involves the change of method and the redirection of this policy, given the challenges of the 21st century. I would like once again to mention transparency, which is a new idea in international trade negotiations. It is cruelly missing today, but it is indispensable to restore trust. Citizens trust. Citizens have the feeling, and it's not always wrong, that trade negotiations are held just for the sake of it, as though they were the final objective. Transparency should apply to the negotiation process when it's launched and when it's ongoing. What is being discussed? What is at stake? What could a good agreement be? There is a democratic justification that is obvious in transparency. I would like to speak my mind frankly. An agreement that cannot be justified to public opinion should not be negotiated. I would like to add that negotiations cannot only be a matter for experts. Civil society must be involved in all its various aspects. This is what I wanted to do in France with a strategic monitoring committee that I convened at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs at the Quai d'Orsay with members of civil society, trade unions, associations, NGOs, professional bodies, and of course with members of parliament who will say we will have the final vote or yes or no different negotiations, including with the United States. And I know that in the US there is also very strong control by Parliament on the different negotiations and it's completely coherent with the strong democratic tradition and the power of Parliament in this country. The point of view is important and it can even enlighten the state in the course of the negotiations. Lastly, I am of course not forgetting uh, the vital role of citizens who have to be informed permanently. We must go further, restore meaning and redirect policy in view of major challenges of the 21st century. Trade negotiations are not uh, a goal by themselves. They belong to policies and to larger goals and aims. Globalization has sparked two conflicting attitudes. On the one hand, naive support. Globalization would be good as such. On the other, protectionist or hostile reactions to opening that is considered uncontrolled and destructive and a principle of closing borders all around the world. These are in fact two pitfalls to be avoided. Globalization does not spontaneously provide the advantages that people have the right to expect. Objectives must therefore be set for the economic development and employment of our fellow citizens, and trade should become a means and not an end in itself. For the 21st century, we need rules not to prevent and restrict economic activity, but to reconcile it with public interests and the global challenges of this century. To my mind, the international community should therefore address two key issues in the coming years. On the one hand, give the protection of public interest its rightful place. On the other, update international trade rules to meet the global challenges of the future. Better protecting public interests is today necessar a necessary response to certain excesses of globalization. I am thinking in particular of the controversy raised by private arbitration tribunals between investors and states. It is clear that taxpayers cannot accept to compensate businesses for the public policy choices made by the governments. It is for this reason that I have been working very hard for Europe to propose a completely new approach, a new mechanism 
that would allow development towards an international investment law and a multilateral uh, investment court, applying transparent rules, preventing conflict of interests, and uh, being completely coherent with our multilateral approach of these issues. The other major project, and I will uh, stop and conclude on this idea, is that of environmental and social crisis. Last December, we held the COP21 conference in Paris, the conference on climate change. And for the first time in history, the international community took a binding commitment concerning over 160 countries to fight effectively against global warming, which is a global issue, a global challenge, and it's true all over the world. The treaty was signed in New York in April. It is an unprecedented success, and yet this global challenge for humanity is not taken into consideration in our trade agreements and in several ongoing trade negotiations. Admittedly, these agreements provide for chapters devoted to sustainable development, but generally they are very general and not binding. This has to change. What's the point in gathering everyone around the table to protect the environment if the trade rules, which are so important to global economy, do not take this into account? In the same way, we must incorporate ambitious objectives in, in terms of working conditions and social legislation in the agreement, because then the economy and broader goals can come together. To move forward on these topics, we need more than ever to have discussions all around the world, and especially with our American partners, allies, and friends. Europe, European, and US citizens share these concerns to a great extent. Ongoing negotiations are not easy, but the objective is to find new ideas and new rules for the economy of today and of tomorrow. Thank you.